I will be talking about Slick today. And uh, Slick is a database access uh, library in, uh, in Scala. And the whole presentation would be about introduction. So uh, I, would be not, I won't be talking about things like internals work, what is the philosophy behind Slick, how to deal with uh, certain more complicated stuff. The general idea and the, let's say, success of this presentation would be at, at the, after this presentation, you go back to work on Monday and you need to start working with Slick. You can basically get the samples that I have and with help of the samples of this presentation, you would be able to start pretty quickly, right? And do uh, productive things. So uh, Slick is an interesting library because as for me, uh, I started to using it like about between one year and one year and a half ago. And I spent like one, two weeks uh, playing with Slick and uh, I had some problems, right? Especially as this was the time when the Slick, tree, a Slick Tree was released. There wasn't that much of a, of a documentation back then. And the paradigm in Slick 3 is much more uh, functional than in Slick 2. And after one weekend, I read a perfect book, which I, I, I have a link for it in, uh, at the end of the presentation. And then it clicked. And when it clicked, I suddenly was able to do basically what most what I needed to do. But the downside of that was that I kind of forget what was the real problem, right? So the point of this presentation is to help you get this mental click. Uh, this presentation together with the repository, all the samples that are in the presentation are in the repository. You can, uh, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, the link is not that long, but if you want an easier, easier link, this is the actual link to the presentation, right? So if you, if you, if you take it, it's easy to, to, to find. I will probably take it down in like uh, a week or something, but uh, you can check it, out right, uh, check it out right now. There is a link to the GitHub repo in this presentation. Uh, and what about me? Um, uh, one of the pretty good presenters told me once that you shouldn't really talk about you that much in the presentation because people who are interested in who you are already could check it out or will do it after the presentation. And those people who are not interested in what you do, well, they are not interested anyway. What is, what is important though is what I wanted to point, uh, point is uh, Virtus Lab, which is a uh, sponsor of the conference and my personal uh, kudos to Virtus Lab because uh, thanks to them, I, I am here today and can, can, uh, can present the subject to you. But let's go to the click, right? So what is a slick? Perhaps the good idea would be to start by saying what it isn't, right? And Slick definitely is not an ORM, right? So object relational mapping. Uh, there are lots, lots of, uh, uh, lots of, uh, let's say, uh, bad fame about the ORM appeared at some point in the history. Some famous people in the industry were saying bad things about the ORMs like Jeff Atwood of the uh, Stack Overflow uh, flow fame or Martin Fowler of the fame in general. And uh, that, has some, uh, that had some merit, right? Because uh, there were problems with ORMs. If you, if you, if you think about like if you were using Hibernate or eBean, which is used in, in play, there were a couple of different uh, problems connected with uh, ORMs. Uh, some of them was like this n plus one problem, right? You fetched a collection of items and then you uh, try to access one of the attributes and you fired the lazy, uh, because of the lazy loading, you fired, uh, or lazy execution or lazy fetching, whatever, you fired additional queries within your loop, each hitting the database, right? And you even, wasn't even aware of that, right? That's actually uh, this point, right? Execution under the cover, things like this, and well, it's one problem. Or cache, for instance, you access some setters in the Hibernate entity, and at some point it may uh, flash to the database, but you are not really always aware where it happens, right? Session context scope, things like you can access one of the uh, lazy attribute or very lazy connection, but if you are within a scope of some session or transactional scope, whatever, depending on the, uh, on the actual framework, you, are, you put it, for instance, on the, on the UI layer somewhere on your front end, right, in your controllers, 
you try to access one of the, one of the attribute, uh, attributes that suddenly you can't because uh, you are outside of the session scope. So, and on top of this, the last thing was this or uh, object relational impedance mismatch. So this all boils down to thing which I call false promise, right? The, for instance, like Hibernate gave you promise that you can somehow operate on a database like you would operate on objects, which turns out to be not true, right? Because those two uh, paradigms, relational and object-oriented, are actually quite different. And also there is another, another uh, thing which I call, in this case, leaky abstraction. Because if you think about like Hibernate, except the things that were connected with the database itself, there were things like, you needed to learn about things like uh, merging entity, refreshing entity. Entity could have been in some kind of a detached state, attached state, right? It, it, you needed to know this stuff, right? Because you needed to be aware that some of the changes would be flushed to the database or not, right? So. Uh, the abstraction wasn't perfect. And what about Sleek? Sleek is uh, FRM, which is uh, uh, a synonym, which is uh, short for uh, functional relational mapping. But the more important thing is that it actually embraces the model that is in a database. So you operate on a data as they are in a database. And you do that, do this through the functional paradigm, but uh, accidentally, functional paradigm seems to be much better uh, to operate on the relational data, beta, the data uh, paradigm comparing to object-oriented one. Uh, there is a, actually a nice piece of the, uh, of the documentation. And the documentation for Sleek is much better th these days than it was in the past. And you have a nice introduction for people who came from the OR ORM world. Uh, a few words about the reactive, right? Everything in Sleek is asynchronous, right? But, well, we all know that JDBC is not really asynchronous. JDBC is a blocking, uh, blocking uh, let's say, a piece of code, right? It executes within the threat that you, that you fire some kind of an action. So this is not really this kind of a presentation that I would be talking about this stuff, but I really advise you to take a look at this particular presentation, which you have linked here, and it's by Stefan Seiger, who is actually the creator of Sleek and he talks about his stuff, and it appears that you actually don't need that much of connections, and by connections, it also means that that many threads which are operating, which are blocked on the DB operation. So, uh, it, it turns out that even for the application which handles like 10,000 requests simultaneously, you may only need like 10 different connections, 10 threads, right? So, uh, and, and on top of this, there are some asynchronous drivers, although they are not really production ready, but something happens, right? So it may happen that in some point in time in the future, these asynchronous drivers will be ready and Sleek will work with them just like that. So you all here are basically uh, familiar with the concepts of the reactive programming and things like that, so I won't bore you with all this stuff. But what is important from this perspective is that you don't want to block on the general thread pool. What you do is to use the designated thread pool for your blocking operation on the database. And that's how Sleek essentially works. Another part is this description versus execution. When you use, for instance, Hibernate, these description and execution was really intermixed together, right? And with, for you, like people accustomed to functional way of doing stuff, this uh, separation between description and execution is something that is probably pretty common, right? And even for people working in Java, it's like uh, these days with, the, with Java 8 and Stream API, you can uh, do basically the same, right? Have the description or recipe, if you will, and then you have some, uh, some operation at the end which actually executes the recipe, which does some action. And in Scala, we will go to this example uh, a little bit further, we will be essentially going back and forth and, and with, as our knowledge will expand to analyze this, some of these uh, constructs. But the important part on this, uh, at this moment is that we have a description here, right? Some kind of a description. You can probably figure out that it's uh, some kind of a query with that does couple of joins. And then here it's executed. Um, 
All right, last thing is uh, type safe. So again, the same sample that was, uh, that was uh, a moment ago. That's exactly the same piece of code. You can see here that we are operating on some kind of an object, right? And we are operating on some kind of, I don't know, attributes. Uh, maybe there are some methods. We'll, we'll see in a moment. But the thing is, there is no some kind of a concatenation of strings or things like that. We are operating on the actual Scala code using Scala DSL. So if you were to remember one thing from this presentation, it would be uh, the monadic trio. This basically will help you make this mental click, right? That if you understand that, uh, going with slick, slick is pretty easy. So we have three things, three monads. One is query, which is basically the description of how you access, the, how, you, uh, how you create or description of the database query. Then you take and transform this query into a DB, uh, DBIO action, which is a description of a single or multiple different operations on a database, which may be a select statement, insert statement, update statement, or even creating of some kind of schema. Uh, and then you convert it into future, but you all know what future is, right? Because uh, everyone, uh, we, you know what it is, you know how to operate with future, so it's not uh, anything new. The most important part is this, DBIO. If you get the mental grasp on this, this guy here, you will be uh, pretty ready to, to, to uh, work with Slick. The other thing to remember is this DBIO composition. So basically that's exactly kind of the same what was on the previous slide, right? You think about composing operation and uh, firing them at the end together. Uh, and perhaps the last thing to which we should allow you to, to, to deal with Slick easily is you need to remember that it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a, it tries to uh, mimic the uh, collection API in Scala, right? So all those filters, all those things that you do on collections is basically the, uh, the whole idea how you create queries. All right, so these three, three things, which are actually two things, DBIO and collections API, are things that will help you to do this mental click. So this is kind of a agenda of this, uh, what we will have, what we will cover in this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, let's start with tables. And on some of the slides, I put uh, the name of a specification that exactly points you to the exact class within the repository that is uh, kind of a companion of this presentation. So that's a silly example, right? It's, it will, it, what it shows is like this is some kind of a test, so noise. This is again some kind of noise. We are doing blocking weight, something that we shouldn't really do but it is, it's, it's, it's uh, concise and easy. This is another way of doing this. What is important here, what I wanted to show is you have create a DB instance and you do it like this. You create database for config. You pick some kind of a configuration from somewhere. I'll show you in a moment where this configuration is. And you uh, create some kind of a, a operation or query. This is the only sample in this presentation when I use actual SQL, because you can use actual SQL slick if you want to. And you put, put it into the run method and it creates a future. When you got future, you basically map over it and you have some results, right? How the configuration looks like? Well, in my case, it looks like this. It's obviously for demo purposes, but you got the idea, right? There's not much of the, of the configuration here. Uh, all right. So, how do we go with the, the first building block was these tables. So what are these tables? So tables are, uh, in essence, there's a couple of things that are here, right? Let's see, let's see three uh, blocks. One of them is this. It's a case class that we use to, uh, in our application. So whatever, we, this, this is uh, the result of the query, how we, how we deal with this piece of information in the application. This is kind of a definition of how, how our table looks like. So we can see things like uh, that we have a column name, we have a column ID, of, it's of type long, it's a primary key, it's auto increment. This part here is important, right? Because this part here is the def default projection. You may have multiple different projections, but you need to have this one, right? The uh, default projection. And what it does in here is essentially telling Sleek that when you get the tuple from the database, in order to create our case class, you need to have a method 
to which you will pass a tuple and it will create our case class. And this is exactly vice versa. Take the tuple, uh, take the uh, case class, create a tuple, right? So, interesting thing here. A very common misconception for Slick is that it's only use, it only works with case classes. The thing is that you can work with whatever you want, right? You can have pure tuples instead of case class. You can have class without case, right? Normal class. Uh, it's only convenient because those two methods are by default in your case classes. So it's much more convenient to use case classes. And here we create the object that we will be using to uh, do queries and operations on this particular uh, table. All right, so uh, let's see example. So uh, we have university table, which is our, uh, this, this is the, our query object, right? Which was the table query object, which was here. And we use the result. The result on the table query object basically generates select uh, star, uh, star from the table. Result actually creates the, uh, uh, converts this uh, query into DBIO. So we have an operation and we run it. We have nothing in the database. Then we do another operation. We add two elements to the database. Then we do query again. And we should have these two within the results. Easy. So let's go to the actions, right? So because that's one of the most important building blocks. And again, monadic trio. So this is another, we know a little bit more. So let's take a look at this right now. So we have this guy, we already saw, saw him. We do something new, filter, which is basically workloads, right? And this part is query, one, one, uh, one uh, member of our monadic trio. Then we have DBIO action on DBIO. And then we put all this into the run method, which generates future. Okay, so how can we, uh, let's have a glimpse of how can we change the, uh, the code that we had before uh, into some kind of a composition. That's more or less how would you normally, realistically do it. Instead of doing each of these queries separately, what you would do normally is you would uh, create a select, then insert these two values that we had before, and then create another select, and then you would check that this guy here should be empty. After, after executing these inserts, this one shouldn't be empty and should contain the element. The difference here is that we didn't execute each of them separately, but we composed the uh, recipe of the different operations and put everything here. And this is something that will be uh, soon uh, coming back to this example in a, in a moment. So what is DBIO action and what is DBIO? How they relate to one another? So DBIO action is an interesting uh, type because it has, it has some three interesting type parameters and one encodes the type of the result, the another encodes the, uh, the whether it's streaming or not streaming and we won't cover this, uh, this in the, uh, during this presentation. The last thing is the effect, right? And if you think about what is DBIO, DBIO is simply a simplified alias, right, to this, uh, to this type which basically assumes that you have no streaming and all effects are allowed. Uh, so the only type parameter that you have is the type of the results. All right, so this, this gives us, and this is interesting, right? Because we have an action and it encodes different, uh, different kinds of information within its type. What we can do with this, for instance, it's, uh, as this is so powerful idea, we can, for instance, create a uh, method which will take as a parameter action, which have uh, whatever result, it's streaming or not streaming, whatever, but it only accepts read effect. And what it does is basically uh, executes this uh, particular operation. So this will work because it generates the read effect, uh, but this wouldn't because it generates the write effect. So it, this guy wouldn't even compile. And a couple of different effects that you can have. For instance, here you have an effect which is read, obviously, this is a select. Here you have an effect which is write, because we are doing insert. Interesting here, because we are doing the same and wrapping the transaction, and what we have is effect write with transactional. Interesting. At the end we have this, this guy, which is for the schema creation. 
So we have another type of DFN that you can create a schema outside, uh, uh, starting from your definition in, uh, in your application. Okay, queries. Uh, queries start with, not surprisingly probably, with the uh, type which is called query. And again, it, it has a couple of different uh, parameters. And these parameters are mix type, unpack type, and collection type. Out of which, as for me, only collection type seems somewhat familiar, at least in, in the beginning when I started with it. So let's see what it is. Uh, all right. If we, this is one of the, uh, one of the queries uh, in, in a slick, and it's not that obvious which type is which. So let's try to decompose it. Uh, this thing is our unpacked type. All right, so it's the type that we use from the, in our business logic in the application, right? That's unpacked type, easy. Mixed type is the type that Slick uh, uses for inside creation, for instance, of queries. And if you think, if you look here, I put this underscore, which means a blank parameter, and default parameter for this. Uh, uh, it's, it's substituted by the parameter in this, in this function here. And this is exactly mixed type, which is university table. So when we, uh, when we use this dot name, we actually uh, refer to this. OK, so let's take a look at from the another perspective. We have a query, university filter, that's a query. It has following, following type parameters. The one thing that I didn't mention is that it's the query returns the collection type of sequence. For instance, for update, it could be our option of integer, right? How many rows were affected. Uh, result compare, uh, converts this query into DBIO, which is sequence of the university, so this and this. And when we execute it on database, we have a future of sequence university. So exactly the same as here, but we have a future. All right, code samples. We will have a couple of queries. And this may be, uh, pretty, this is again, pretty simple query. What do we do here? You already know that dbrun executes the well, query we have here. After the result, we have dbio. dbrun executes our operation. So what we have here after that is actually a future. We map over future and convert to the list of results into the tuple of name and surname. So instead of having only uh, the whole case class, we have only tuple of name and surname. But the actual query would look like this, right? Because query is composed query, uh, uh, composition of a query is terminated somewhere here. Here we have a query and here we run it. After that, it already went to the database. So this mapping didn't do anything with the actual query. But take a look at this example. What we do here is we do course model, uh, student table, we dump the results. So we do map over a query and we create, we uh, perform the mapping to tuple here. So here we have termination of the query, result converts it into DBIO, and then we put everything into the dbrun, which executes the query. The resulting query is this which is interesting because we just started constructing queries. So let's have a couple of different, uh, so different uh, queries composed. The easiest query we saw already is select a star from the table. You can write it in a, in a, different, uh, in a different way, like this. It will be exactly the same. So you can pick whatever, uh, whether, whichever form suits you better. Uh, we can have, uh, obviously, this query to be executed, we need to do something with it, and that's, that is something that you already saw. So you may create, a, for instance, a method like this, have a query here. You need to uh, use this result, which would convert it into DBIO, and put it into dbrun, which would actually uh, push the query into the database. So let's just focus only on uh, queries itself without execution. This student table map, you already saw it, it creates something like this, right? We, this map is projection. Another example, we have another projection. Uh, this time we do a projection to the name and then to the middle name, which is an optional value and we use one of the database function if null. That means that if the, data, if the value is null, we can uh, substitute it with something like this. And at the end, we do sort by uh, name. Does it make sense? 
it should produce something like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Well, the problem is that Actually, this thing won't even compile. The problem here is that uh, you need to, if you go back to the beginning of the presentation, you need to think in terms of collections. So, uh, in this moment, when you did map, what you normally in the collections, what would be the input here is actually the result of this map, right? Because you have uh, the chain of these different uh, commands. And after this, as a parameter of this, we have a tuple with two strings. Not our, uh, not our uh, representation of a row from the database. So what you can do is do something like this. And as you know that you have tuple right now here, you basically, uh, you basically use the first element from the tuple, which happens to be name, which will generate the query as we want it to be. The another example would be if, if you know, and you probably know that, that SQL is basically, a, in most extent, is a declarative language. So for SQL, it doesn't really matter that much, or in most cases, what is the order of some of these, uh, some of these uh, constructs. So what you can do is do the sorting first, and then do, do the mapping, and the generated query would be exactly the same, right? Because for the, for the SQL, well, you cannot put order before the from, right? Uh, so this is how you deal, for instance, with that. Important thing. You uh, look at the query from the perspective of the collections API. That's the, that's the main point here. More, intra, more maybe uh, complicated example, you get multiple mappings. And although you get multiple mappings, it basically converts to what you would expect, right? You, have, you pick only one field from the, uh, from the table. You concatenate it with a string, which is here. Then you do uppercase, which is here. Then you do trimming, which on my particular database is composed of left trim and right trim. And then you add some other, uh, use some functions and concatenate them together. The same. All right, uh, filtering. So you may do basically all of these queries you can do with these different forms, right? You can use either this for comprehension or you can use this and this form uh, in most cases. Uh, so this is filtering. This, is, this would obviously uh, be converted into where. And another example, a little bit more complicated, we got the negation of, the, uh, of this uh, filtering and a little bit more complicated filtering conditions here. As you could probably expect, it would be translated to something like this. Okay, so one more example gonna, with, the, with sorting. Uh, we have two different types of sorting and we use not null parameter. Again, nothing, sorry, nothing spectacular. It's exactly as you would expect. You need to, uh, I cannot emphasize this enough, you need to remember about this, that it you actually uh, look at it, or this uh, whole idea from the perspective of the Scala collections. So if you like here have drop two, right? It will remove two elements from, the, from your resulting set and take three elements. So this would probably convert into uh, offset and limit. And here it is, we have limit three, the order is different, but the limit three, which is take three, and offset two, which is drop two. Another example, what I did here is I switched drop and take. The order is different. So if you think about it from the SQL perspective, it doesn't really matter. However, from the collection API, it would matter, right? Because you would take three elements, and then when you have three elements, you would drop two of them, which, and you would end up with one element in your result. So this is the actual query that gets generated and it actually makes sense, right? If you think from the perspective of the collection uh, API. Uh, okay. So uh, another example with group by, I think we may, oh, maybe there's something interesting. I, I thought that we may skip it, but there's one interesting thing. We don't have, when you do, when you use grouping in, in, in a SQL, you use having if you want to filter over the values uh, produced by uh, aggregation, uh, uh, which you use in, in group by, uh, together with group by close. You don't have such a thing on a, on a slick level. What you do is basically, whenever you have filter here, it would generate where. But any filter after grouping would generate having, right? Important thing here is that when you group something, then you need to, you can only use in your projection the, uh, the attributes that were used in the group by 
or for the other things you need to use some aggregation. This is not true for all the databases, but it's true for most of them. Uh, so, okay, joins. So let's go to a little bit more complicated queries. We have two different types of joins. Uh, me, we can, or maybe the joins are, the, uh, sorry, we may, we may construct joins in two different ways. Uh, so to, to go into, the, uh, into joins, how we generate queries with joins, let's take a look at this. It's basically more or less the same that we had before. The interesting points are here, I think here, and I think here. And let's take a look at them. First of all, what I'm doing is I am uh, somehow defining what are the relations between my data. Right? I got foreign keys, three different foreign keys. And then I say that I have, uh, well, I have ID, and this is actually, I think that's, that shouldn't be, I wanted to show this one. Well, never mind. Uh, it's, uh, you have a student ID, which is ID of type student. And this is interesting part here because I didn't use long here, right? Because normally when you use synthetic, uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic uh, ID in a database, you store it as a, as a big int and therefore in, in your Java or Scala code you use store it as a long. Well, this has uh, two disadvantages. One of them will show in a moment, but another one is that if you store longs, you, are, you need to be really careful about you know, putting, uh, sending this long on the on UI because in JavaScript the precision of long is different than in Java. So if you have really big numbers, they would not be the same. You send something to UI, and for instance, your JavaScript sends it back, and the number is different because uh, if you uh, if you have a really big number, right? So you probably never should use longs as IDs if you have high IDs because uh, they, would go to, uh, they can go screwed on the, uh, on the JavaScript side. But uh, there is one more advantage which I will discuss in a moment. Uh, in a moment, in, in, this, in this particular moment, let's see how the, how the joins, uh, query with joins looks like. So we have a uh, monadic version, so again, for comprehension. We use here these uh, foreign keys that we defined, and we at the end yield result, which is basically our projection, right? Yield converts to map. And here we have obligate form, which is uh, a little bit more uh, explicit. We say that we want to join. We want to join uh, on this particular field connected with this. So this field is from the student course segment table. This one is from the course table in the same idea here. OK, so these two notations are equivalent. But the second, uh, the second uh, advantage of that I use some custom case class for ID is that if I use it in such a way, you are not able to construct your, to join uh, on uh, incorrect keys. So in this case, if you look at like this, uh, this, I joined with course table and I wanted to use student ID because I mixed those two together and match it with ID from the course table, this guy wouldn't work. It wouldn't even compile because I have different types here. So that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, the whole type safety idea is uh, very strong within, uh, within Slick. Uh, so more complicated join, I think we may, uh, we may skip it because you probably get an idea how, uh, what it does. The only important thing here is that, this is applicable version, that what I do when I join with other table, I have here a tuple, right? With the entry from one table and the entry from another, and I join giving the uh, condition. But when I join on the second or the third table, I start here with first what I had here, so segment, and I use blank parameters because I didn't care about this, and then course, which is from here. And again, on the semester table, I have this guy, or actually up to here, which is this, what I had before, plus one more semester. Right? So each time I have more nested tuples, which maybe depending on your taste, maybe not that, uh, uh, not that elegant. However, uh, it still creates you know, some kind of a query as you would expect. It used the old form of joins, but except that it's pretty readable. The other form it is, exact, is exactly the same. You can use it like this, right? With the four comprehension, it's much more readable. You don't have these nested tuples and things, uh, and it's basically the same. It generates the same query. So whether you pick one form or another, in most, in most cases, depends on your taste. Uh, which one is more suitable for a particular uh, query. 
So let's jump right now to the outer joints. So again, this is a definition of another table. What is important here is that we have option here and we have top foreign key, which I have highlighted here. We have this option and we have this option here on the student ID because for left joints we have optional relations. And I added this because this is required. I added this uh, question mark here for the foreign key definition. How we use it? Basically the same. Only that we use left join, right? Or rather join left. Uh, it would generate a query like this, which is again probably expected. And uh, probably something that we, you need to remember is that when you use join, uh, when you use outer join, one part of your uh, on your join would be optional. So in this case, the student is actually an option of student, which results in this map here, right? You cannot uh, actually invoke this name on it. You first need to map over it and then put your uh, filtering condition. But the generated query is again something that you would expect, right? Uh, so there is one, uh, one problem. When you use outer joins, you cannot use this for comprehension because it only, you only can use uh, the applicative form. However, there is, uh, there, is this, uh, uh, there is this issue already raised. Basically, this guy says that it would be nice to have something like this. So this is basically our for comprehension, but that it should work with the, uh, with the outer joints. It's smart, that's 3.2 uh, version of Slick, which I am using right now for the presentation, and it's not there, so well, maybe it won't be in the Slick 3.2 but it probably will be there at some point. Last thing, composition and transaction. This is pretty important because that's the last element that should make your working with Slick somehow click. Uh, in order to invoke a transaction, you basically uh, call this transactionally on the DBIO operation. Uh, and how it, would, how it will, you will look, it's like you basically have an operation, this is DBIO, and you call transactionally on it, and then put it within DB run. So that's what you did in the past. And the result would be that it runs in the transaction. However, uh, this, if you have one operation, it doesn't really, well, most of, the, uh, most of the times we want to have multiple operations being composed together and run them, and run them all together within a single transaction. That's why we use most often transactions for. So you need to remember that this DBIO is a monad, right? So the question would be, what do you normally use in order to uh, compose multiple uh, monads together? Well, what kind of operation do you use? Zip. Well, you can use zip, but if you want to create, for instance, uh, well, you could use zip, but that's the not most straightforward solution, right? The most straightforward, what you do is basically use for comprehension and things like that, so you do flat map, flat map, flat map, map, right? So that's basically what you need to do, is you basically take this DBIO and you take another uh, DBIO and I don't need to explain to you that this is a series of flat map and the map and the end. So you, what you basically do is flat map, that's shit, right? So you got this uh, one, uh, one operation, you flat map over the other, and at the end you create a composed uh, DBIO which has multiple operations. And, on, and when you have one DBIO at the end, you add transactionally, and that's all. The other ways uh, how you can combine multiple, uh, multiple DBIOs is, for instance, the SEC. It's a, the, it's, a, it's a method on DBIO, and you can have multiple DBIO operations. So, for instance, multiple insert, you don't really care what they return, which you care that they all are either running a transaction or not. So you can use DBIO seek. By that, you, you get DBIO view it, which is a composition of all of these operations, but you don't care about the result. And before firing this, so putting this DBIO into, into DB run, you call transactionally on it. That's all. If you want to have a sequence of operation and you care about the result, uh, you can use a sequence. DBIO sequence, which basically does the same, but it returns the uh, DBIO of sequence of the results of these uh, operations that you have here. So for an example, let's look at this. You have a student table, you have a result which is uh, select from the table, and then 
you have uh, you want to perform additional queries for each of the row from the from this result. So what you do, you have uh, you have a sequence here. So what you do is basically take the sequence, map over it, call a method, and this method what it does is perform other query. So it returns the DBI of sequence of courses. So basically what I do here, it's pretty silly, I know, because I could do it in a, probably in a single query, but for the, uh, for the case of the uh, uh, educational example, I, cr I created one query, get all the students, and then going through one student at a time, I created another query and, uh, and get the list of courses for each of the students. And here I have them, so I at the end have a sequence of sequence of courses. Each sequence here are sequences for uh, courses for particular students. So I had here uh, DBI of sequence of courses, put it into this DBIO sequence, and it converted it so I could, so I could use it as a single DBIO uh, element here. And at the end, you need. Sometimes what you need to do right, is you perform some operation, like I get something from database, then, having data from the database, you want, to, uh, you want to perform some calculations that are not really database related. And at the end, you perform some other operation database. The problem here is that this is not DBIO, so this guy won't compile, right? So what you need to do is somehow lift this thing that you have here into DBIO. And what you can do is, for instance, take a DBIO successful, and then you have operation on database, some operation which is not database related, but you wrap it inside the DBIO. And then everything, when you combine it, you can, you can one single DBIO because you flat mapped uh, everything here and you do it transactionally. Obviously, but that's the other subject. You don't want to do too many calculations or, I don't know, connecting to other systems within a single transaction because you don't want to have long running transaction. So combine operations. That's basically what you do. Combine different operations, put them together, put them into some method that would, because most of the operations in the application, you want them to, have, to be transactional, you apply transactional and, and run them against database. Uh, so, things to remember. Sleek is not an ORM, and you basically need to think about these three things, which is future, DBIO, and query. It's, uh, very much uh, of the sleek is connected with how you compose your DBIO operations, and you basically need to think about uh, in terms of the collections API. Uh, last thing, uh, I think that there were many presentations in the past about the performance or the uh, way how the uh, how the queries were generated, that they were really not optimal, not how uh, normal person, no normal sane person would write such a such a query. To most extent, it's over, right? In Sleek2.x, there were some problems with, for instance, you created some joins and it created nested queries, which were really running very slow. To much extent, this has been solved, right? So it's much better than it was in the past. And I think that's all from me. Hey, um, from my, I have a few questions. But um, <clears throat> first of all, this uh, the syntax that <clears throat> Basically, the Scala syntax uh, instead of uh, SQL. Yeah. Um, how does this work for you? Because I have uh, some background with uh, SQL and I'm kind of comfortable <coughs> using that. Uh, and here it's like a, a little bit different approach to the queries. So I'm wondering uh, if it's hard uh, to migrate this different way of uh, doing queries. So the question is uh, is it hard to mentor? mentally shift to, I mean, like it's, uh, if you are accustomed to Scala, it's basically as you saw, like, I don't know if I have uh, some examples here. I do have some example. As you can see, it's like most of these examples, if you look at them, you are pretty able to figure out what would be the resulting, uh, resulting query, right? They are not that complex. Obviously, in any serious application, you end up with some SQL queries that are two pages or five pages long, depending on your application, and that happens. And I wouldn't definitely use Sleek for that. Uh, I think that, like, it's a question of taste. For the, that's the answer for your, for your question. But I wouldn't also use Sleek for much, much more complicated queries. I would do two things. Either would use plain SQL and I would have full control over it, though I would lose type safety. Or I would create kind of some kind of a view in the database 
and I would do whatever is there, and then I would use view from here, which I think would be the best choice. Like I would rather be uh, more like uh, for this solution because it seems like a little bit clearer of separation. On the database, you have all the tweaks and all the complicated things, and in the code, you have type safety and, well, read readability. Mm -hmm. uh, since you just mentioned this, how does it create uh, schema migrations and stuff like this, and creating this kind of views and changing tables? Um, does it provide something, some system for that, or it just executes uh, SQL or, you know? No. The answer is there was something like that to some extent in the past. You can create schema. Uh, but to be honest, what we did most often is I, here, even if the, if the, in the GitHub repository, what I did for the sake of the example, I created schema once. But what I mostly did is I used uh, Flyway, Flyway, yeah, Flyway, which is for the database migrations and, and things like that. It's basically, it's uh, basically technology, I mean, it's technology agnostic. It works, it's for the Java. But it doesn't really matter because it picks, you know, uh, files as you specify them. It's a little bit like evolutions in play if you if you use them in the past. So that's something like that. Uh, I'm not aware of any, and I don't. I'm pretty sure there are no any mechanism for schema migration. Um, does uh, Slick check the the schema at at boot or at um, when <coughs> or something like this and compare what you have in your definitions of the tables or? Uh, that's a tough question because in the past there was for sure such a mechanism and I'm not sure because I, we have never used that in, in uh, Sleek, right, to, to check the schema. So uh, I'm not sure how, is it, uh, how it is in, in Sleek 3 to be honest. I would need to check this out because I don't know, I don't, don't want you to give you, you know, Incorrect answer. Do all of the subs to the table. So for one big table, you can have multiple markings, but let's say it keeps only yeah. like two or three goods from that. So it doesn't check the schema. Yeah, um, and last question for me um, about uh, like query optimization. You already said some things about that, but um, did you have problems? Uh, maybe. Maybe there was a query which was really not running very fast or something like that generated. And uh, I mean, it can happen for sure, but uh, is it possible to like use database specific features, for example, of uh, Postgres or something like that to, to do optimization or then you have to resort to SQL? Uh, no, we didn't use anything like that. You can create uh, some things, but we never actually did use it except some custom functions, right, that you can use within a Slick, for instance, custom functions that are used in your database. To a large extent, we didn't have that much problem because what we, what we figured out is that if you have something complicated, just put it inside a view if it's really complicated. And if it's multiple joins and conditions and groupings and things like that, this part works mostly. Uh, pretty good. What you need to remember is that, you know, with the normal application, you need to do something like this, right? This is bonus part, but you can take a look at this. You just pre-compile queries because to generate the query, these, uh, the compiler of the query needs to go through something like this. There's many stages and actually this query executes in a database in uh, half a millisecond and it takes 20 milliseconds to construct. So we obviously don't want to do that every time. So what you do is do this compiled and this guy uh, at the end generates uh, ready prepared statement and you use it over and over again. So that's the only thing that you would normally do, right? At least what we did. Any other questions? Why not recompile the compilation time using macros? Um, like it's not good. It's good. Well, I mean, it's not going to change, right? Well, yeah, that's, that's probably something that could be done. Uh, I don't know if there is any, uh, any let's say, um, any work toward this direction. Uh, it may be, I don't know, it sounds like something that may be possible. Although, you know, it's like, it's like uh, Java virtual machine, right? Uh, you need to, for many cases, you just start it and you need to make it, you know, uh, you need to go through a couple of actions so it is hot, right? And it's the same like this. 
yeah, it may be a little bit slower for first couple of things, but then, well, it's, it's the only problem after the restarting. Obviously, what you say, yeah, it seems like it's, it makes sense, right? Probably to generate some kind of a, in a compile time, why not? But we, we were using it. I think the point would be that at this point, I don't know what the driver is, what the circuit is, and you know, we compile differently for the key and the base. And I don't know what the state of data at some point sleep was prepared to work also for known uh, relational yeah. basis. So then you also don't know where to be clear because it's like abstract stuff. You can only compile it when you know where you want to do it. I think you should be able. Like, okay, that's. A, I think that's a discussion for because we are already uh, out of time. Uh, so, if you have any other question, any other questions, just catch me after the presentation. I would be happy to answer them. And you have a couple of bonus slides at the end, so you can you can take a look at them if you wish. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for uh, hearing my presentation.